Uh, welcome to the third lecture, the course Innovation in Services. Actually, this is the second lecture that uh, deals specifically with the processes of innovation in the service sector. And just to remind you where we now, last time we have investigated the so-called technologist approach, okay, whereby innovation is considered just the simple user adoption of technologies that are produced in the manufacturing sector. Uh, we've discussed a lot about the taxonomy of innovation in services and the technological trajectories that take place in different sectors. And we've also analyzed Barra's reverse product cycle. Okay? And we've said that uh, considering the IT adoption in specific sectors, in particular vanguard services, such as banking or insurance companies, what we observe is in the first place process innovation and then later on when firms have achieved cost efficiency, they develop product innovation or service innovation, if we want to call it like that. We've also analyzed a little bit the limitation of this approach, but nonetheless this is surely one of the most influential approach that we can think of. Then we've briefly discussed the uh, so-called service-oriented approach or demarcation approach whereby innovation is actually analyzed taking into account the specificities of services as compared to manufacturing. So the idea is that uh, technology is important in services so we do need to consider how service companies adopt the technology that is developed elsewhere, but uh, there are some specificities in the service sector that cannot be neglected and that lead to different definitions of innovation. Okay? And we've seen that we can think of ad hoc innovation, for example, innovations that are developed usually in consulting services, expertise field innovation, remember we were talking about new legal issues coming out, for example, of the environmental debate or of the IT revolution and formalization innovation. Okay, in the sense that you can actually increase uh, the tangibility of services by making them more and more standardized. Okay, so this is a form of service innovation that is specific to the characteristics that these uh, activities have. What we are doing today is actually taking a different angle to the analysis of innovation in services and describe the so-called integrative or synthesis approach. Okay? Uh, the basic idea, which is very simple and actually dates back to the Lancaster approach to product characteristics, if you remember something from, I think, industrial economics or something like this, says that uh, innovation has to do with the characteristics, the features of products or services. Okay? And this approach is very interesting because it actually sheds new light also on the possibilities of measuring innovation in manufacturing sector okay, other than the traditional R&D and patents measurements. So the idea is that we were going to investigate the integrative approach for the service sector but then we will make some comparison with the manufacturing sector in order to understand uh, actually what happens in manufacturing we try to adopt this approach. Okay? So uh, what are the main 
very basic characteristics of this integrative approach. Uh, the idea is very simple. Again, goes back to Lancaster. Uh, a product or a service can be described as a set of characteristics. Okay? So whatever kind of product or service you might think of, you can think of a car, you can think of a computer, or you can think of healthcare services. We can identify different characteristics of this service and then try to understand how these characteristics change over time in order to generate innovation. So the idea is that we can adopt a similar approach to manufacturing products and to services, okay, considering though the specificities of the service activities. Uh, the first scholars that discussed this approach are Saviotti and Metcalf. They did it for the manufacturing service. And uh, the idea is this one. So think of very different characteristics. Think of a car, OK? Uh, we have characteristics that have to do with the internal structure of the product, OK? Technical characteristics. For example, the engine, OK? If you take a computer, we can think of the microprocessor, for example, OK? That's a technical characteristic. This is something that, as users, we usually do not see, OK? So we probably have information on the type of engine that runs our car. We have information on the microprocessor that is embedded in our PC, but we do not really see, OK, the technical characteristics. More than that, uh, very often, we care much more about the performance of the product or of the service rather than of technical characteristics. Okay, so as long as our car goes fast, we do not care what is the engine. Okay, what are the technical characteristics of the engine? We are interested in the performance. And this is true both for products and for service. Of course, we are generalizing, but the idea is that uh, not many people are really experts in the technical features of a product or a service. Okay, what we observe is the final result. So we are buying a product or a service because we are, have specific needs, okay, and these needs are fulfilled by an assemble of technical characteristics that we are not really expert about, okay. Very often we do not care about the specificity of the microprocessor in the computer as long as it is fast, the battery lasts long, and so on and so forth, okay. Uh, of course, if we think about uh, the assembly of a product, think again of a computer, think of a car or of any other product, we have a way in which different characteristics are put together. Okay? So products and services are actually different in terms of, if you want, the way in which companies put together the characteristics, develop the product or the service. Remember that if we think of the specificities of services, whenever firms put together the characteristics, they are delivering the service. Okay? So we cannot really distinguish between the production process, if we want to say like this, and the selling in the market. Finally, we have the so-called user characteristics, service characteristics. Okay, now this is what users really evaluate. Okay, unless you're really an expert on computer, on cars, on whatever else, you do not really care about the internal structure, but you care about this, about the service that is provided to you by means of exploiting a product. Okay, the speed of a car, for example the duration of a battery in a computer. You don't care about the materials that are used in order to produce that battery. Well, you might be uh, environmentally friendly, so you might also care about that, okay? But what you really want is a computer whose battery lasts for a long time, full stop, okay? What you really want is, for example, a car that is very safe, okay? How this is achieved is not very much your business, okay? It's something that you're not, again, an expert about. These are the so-called service characteristics. And these are characteristics that are not 
specific of services, okay? But these are really embedded also into products. Because again, we buy a product because we need something, okay? And the way in which the product fulfills our needs is described by the service characteristics, okay? So uh, this is the traditional, if you want, characteristic approach developed for the product, okay? If some of you remembers Lancaster approach on product characteristics, it was a bit less complex, so the idea was we have a set of characteristics, whether they are technical or service, we do not care, and users evaluate each single characteristic, okay? This is one step forward, because the distinction between technical and service is crucial. Okay, so let aside for a second the process characteristics. The idea is that I evaluate service characteristics and this is, okay, the type of characteristics on which I can put a price, a value, okay? My willingness to pay depends very much on this, much less on this. But firms, costs, and therefore price that are made depend very much on this, okay? So, it's like talking about the, if you want, back office and front office characteristics, in a way. Remember when we, we were discussing the banking sector, okay? This has to do with what consumers perceive when they go to a bank. This has to do with what bank actually uh, decide to implement when they build up an IT system or an internet banking or an online uh, trading activity, okay? So, this is for the services. This is for the product, sorry. Uh, Galusian Weinstein in 1997 adapted this approach thinking of the service specificities, okay? Where you have, if you remember, intangibility, you have simultaneity of production and consumption, you have very low formalization so that it is very difficult to extract the process characteristics out of the development of a service. Uh, you have a very strong involvement of users, okay? So yes, users perceive the service characteristics, but they might be involved also in the process of developing actually the services itself, okay? Uh, and also, the type of characteristics that we consider when talking about services are extremely heterogeneous, okay? So uh, we can adapt this approach to services, but we have to bear in mind the specificities of these activities in order to understand how can we consider a service as composed by many characteristics, okay? So think of this as an example like a car or like a computer, and now we think about the specificities of services. Now, think of any service, make an example so that we can try to model this on a practical basis. Give me an example of any service. Insurance, policy. insurance policies. Okay, the provision of insurance policies. Now, uh, for insurance policies, you surely have the definition of service characteristics, which is basically what you as a user want when you go to an insurance company and ask for a policy. Okay, so you have your own specificities, you have your own needs, the company should at least in principle, develop the policy according to that particular need. Then you have technical characteristics, okay? The way in which the company, for example, evaluate the risk, the way in which the company decides the premium that you have to pay in order to get your policy, okay? This is something that is not really visible to the users, okay? Again, unless you've studied lots of math and physics, uh, computing risks is a very difficult task. It's something that is done in the very back office of the insurance company, okay? You just see the final price and the service characteristics. This is what you get when you go and buy an insurance policy. Very often you don't really see all the characteristics, but the idea in any case is that there is something in the back office that is developed according to firms, processes, and competencies, and that's something that you do not really see, okay? And what you're presented with is an ensemble of service characteristics, okay? So technical characteristics, when thinking of services, are very closely linked 
the process characteristics in products, okay? And we can think of front office, back office, and competencies of firms that need to develop front office and back office technical characteristics, okay? Uh, routines. If, I don't know, Sebastiano goes to an insurance company and wants a policy that covers, I don't know, car theft or something else, okay? Well, he has probably his specific needs, but it is very likely that companies have already had a user like him and they can somehow tailor the specific policy using some routines, okay? The way in which they compute risks, okay, is in a way something which is codified knowledge, okay? Uh, together with service and technical characteristics, Valentina, is everything okay? We have providers' competencies and user competencies, okay? So on the one hand, we have a direct mobilization of firm competencies. On the other hand, we have a role of demand. If you go online and build up your own policy, for example, okay, basically what you do is you choose the service characteristics, okay? Uh, you need some competencies to do that, okay? You need some knowledge to understand which are the best characteristics for your policy. In a way, you're involved in the process of service development, okay? So very differently from a product, when we think of a service, we have to think also of the competencies that are on the user side, okay? So again, service characteristics, <coughs> technical characteristics, and competencies on the provider and on the user side, okay? So uh, these are all the features that we need to consider when we think of a service, okay? Given this, what is innovation in services? Now try again to think of the example that he made and try to think what is a new service in the insurance field, for example. What is a new service? Uh, usually if something is new, you're willing to pay for that, okay? So it is quite relevant to think of what is new. Yes. Okay, can you provide an example of that? Yes. Uh -huh. The customer interacts with the end user policy. Okay, other, yeah? Uh, think of the policy issue, the insurance policy issue. Okay, yes? Okay, so for example, the emergence of banks that offer insurance services or of insurance companies that uh, get into the financial service provision might be seen as a joint venture or I mean, at least an alliance across different sectors that might improve the delivery of the service. Yes? Can you also recognize the new kinds of risks? Yes, so uh, there are routines involved in the provision of insurance policies, but of course, some risks that are, were unseen before might emerge, okay? So you have to think of a completely new structure for your policy in order to fulfill users' needs. Other examples? Yes. Policies and they 
Okay, so the bundling of different policies. So very often now you're presented not just with one specific and very tiny policy, but with a bunch of policies that uh, somehow also lock the consumer into a specific company. Okay, so this is of course done also for strategic purposes. Now, uh, think of this, and let's try to investigate what can we think of innovation in services. What actually Galuge and Weinstein thought about when they were discussing innovation in services. Uh, radical innovation, well we can talk about radical innovation also in service, okay? Uh, this is the creation of a new product. But if we consider services as an ensemble of characteristics, this is the creation of an entire new set of characteristics, okay? Completely unconnected with the existing ones. Examples on this. Well, you've already made some of them, okay? Insurance policies covering new risks, okay? Internet banking, mobile data services, these are just some of the possible examples, okay? Uh, this type of innovation, yes? Uh, yes, yeah, that, that would be a radical innovation, although it is not very much competence destroying. Okay, in a way it builds upon uh, the existing competencies, but sure, I mean, it's the provision of an entire new service, okay? Uh, as much as the radical innovation in the manufacturing sector, also in the case of services, very often radical innovation are competence destroying. What does this mean? What are the implications of this for the market? New companies can get into the business, and more than this, existing companies might be get out of the business, okay? So there is a big sort of industrial dynamics going on. You have different actors, okay? They didn't need the competencies that were existing before. Think of the online insurance companies, the online banks, okay? Basically, they do not need a brick and mortar structure. That's a big change. That's really competence destroying, okay? Uh, you need new competencies. You need to know how to manage an IT system, a network system, okay? But you don't really need very many front office competencies, for example, okay? You're just interacting with users via computer, okay? So radical innovation is the creation of a new product which means of a new set of characteristics, okay? Very often, of course, we are, they are generalizing, but very often this implies uh, the destroy of the existing competencies, the emergence of new actors, the changes in the relationship between users and producers. Uh, then we have what they call improvement innovation. Now, improvement innovation builds upon the existing characteristics, okay? No big change in this. It's just if you want the change in the existing characteristics. Examples. These are probably the most common innovations that you get in the service sectors, okay? Try to think of an example of this. So you have a service, you have a set of characteristics, okay? And I'm telling you that there is an improvement innovation when you change some of the characteristics. Yes. <laughs> Who, yeah. Do you think it's just an improvement? Well, oh, I guess some of them, some of them Yeah, and it's probably it's more radical or I show you another type of innovation. Okay. Yeah, but you need a whole set of new technical characteristics. Yeah, that were. 
Okay, uh, this is an interesting uh, perspective. So he's saying, well, the technical characteristics are actually new, but what we perceive in the end is surfing the web through a different platform. So not a big change. Am I correct? Very radical perspective. Yeah, okay, so you're saying from the service characteristics perspective, okay, the new mobile standard is not a very big change, okay? Correct, I agree with you, uh, but still we have to consider that there are some new technical characteristics emerging. Remember his perspective because we will go back to this in a while. Yes. Uh, online check-in. Online check-in, okay. Uh, this is somehow an improvement innovation. Still you need some technical, some new technical systems, not as big as probably in the case of the 3G uh, emergence. Check-in is a very standard procedure, okay? Users know it very well. And it is a process, it is a service that is offered by companies that are already existing in the market, so no big change also on the competence side. Sebastiano, you had some? I'm back, yeah, I don't know. We have two activities. Yeah. Yes, uh, this is a very interesting case, okay? Now, uh, my objection to this as an improvement innovation would be that you really need new competencies, okay? One thing is to heal a person or to make, a, I don't know, a surgical operation. Another thing is to assist the person at home, for example, okay? So the competencies are usually different and actually the companies that are providing those services are usually very different, okay? Uh, but we'll come also to that. Probably the online check-in was the closest example. Here is a very, uh, if you want, not very innovative service, okay? The change in banks office hours, for example. This is a change, this is an innovation in services if we think of this as a set of characteristics, okay? Office hours are one of the characteristics and if you stretch, for example, uh, the office hours of a bank or if you provide online banking services that are available 24 hours a day, beside the fact that they need also new technical characteristics, well, allegedly this is an improvement innovation. So if we believe the characteristics approach, okay, this is, if you want, the less radical form of innovation Okay, you take the characteristics, you just change one or two of them. It's clearly competence enhancing, okay? It's the company that is existing in the market that wants to change the characteristics and that's it, okay? Uh, online checking, yes, it might be seen as an improvement innovation, but I would probably put it more here. So in the conceptualization of Galusian Weinstein, Incremental innovation is something very different from the traditional manufacturing, okay, concepts. Because for them, incremental innovation is actually the adding or removal of single characteristics, okay? Online check-in somehow adds a characteristic, which might be a service characteristic, okay? I can access the check-in from home, for example. So it's probably, more radical than a simple incremental inno improvement innovation, okay? They call it incremental innovation, so don't get confused. Their terminology, I think, is a bit confused, but the idea is that this is more radical than this, okay? So here you just take your set of characteristics and change the content of each characteristic. Here you add something else, okay? So for example, uh, the airport transfer services in hotel, now you see them all over the place, they didn't used to exist, they do not exist in some hotels, okay? Uh, it's not a very big change, it's very much competence enhancing, okay? You're just adding a characteristic to your hotel service, that's it, okay? It's not an improvement because you're actually changing something, you're adding something, you probably need uh, new artifacts, new technologies. You need buses, for example, 
okay? So there is a change in this, but it's not as radical as when we think of an entire set of new characteristics, okay? So radical innovation, I build something completely new, all the characteristics change, most of them at least. Improvement innovation, I take my service and just change the content of some characteristics, office hours. Incremental innovation, I add something to the users via the introduction very often of technical characteristics, but these are not as disruptive as the radical innovation case, okay? If you think of the mobile services, for example, okay, the introduction of different tariff plans, rebate mechanisms. You know what rebate mechanisms are? Autoricarica in Italian, okay? It's the service by which you get paid uh, for as many calls as you make. Okay, this is somehow an incremental innovation. You're changing, you're adding a characteristic to a service which is very standard. Okay, of course, it's not radical, it's not improvement. Now, uh, besides the concept of improvement innovation, I think you're very familiar with radical and incremental innovation if you think of manufacturing. Okay, so I hope and I think that these are not really new concepts, okay? But they are applied to the characteristic approach. So the way in which we define radical innovation and incremental innovation in the manufacturing is slightly different from this idea, okay? Still, you have the notion of competence destroying and competence enhancing. So traditionally, radical innovations are competence destroying, incremental innovation or competence enhancing, Who's bringing this type of innovation in the market? Very often, incremental innovation is for the incumbents and radical innovation is for new entrants. I'm generalizing again, okay? Uh, but these innovations in the manufacturing sector are usually based upon an R&D activity, sometimes upon some output that is patented or at least that is protected in some way. This does not really happen in services. Okay, so if we think of services, even if we think of improvement or incremental innovation, okay, still these services can be very easily imitated. Okay, there's not really a way to protect the services. Actually what happens is that once an hotel introduces the airport transfer, everyone is doing that. Once an airline company introduces the online check-in, everyone is doing that, providing that it's cost effective, okay. So uh, this idea of innovation in services doesn't mean that you know, with this innovation you can protect everything, you can just make sure that comp other companies do not imitate your product or your service, okay? Everything that we've said so far still holds, okay? This is just a way of identifying different types of innovation in service activities. Uh, there is then a set of innovation that are more specific to the service sectors. And this is what uh, Galuge and Weinstein, I think, adds to the idea of the characteristic approach. The first one is the so-called ad hoc innovation. We were discussing this when we talked about the demarcation approach in the service sector, okay? Uh, basically, these are non-programmed innovation. So innovations that emerge as a consequence of the direct contact with the users. They're very common in consultancy, a bit less common, but still can be there in banking and insurance services. So once a bank tailors a financial product, okay, to a specific customer, basically what they do is a doc innovation, okay? They don't have an assembly line for the characteristics. The routines are not there, but they just innovate in order to fulfill the specific needs of that particular user, okay? Uh, very common in general in IT intensive services, okay? Less common in services that require, for example, very large scale or that are uh, somehow quality based, like public services, for example. Very interesting case, and this is interesting because, uh, again, as we were saying before, this increases somehow the tangibility of the services is the so-called formalization innovation, okay? So basically, this means getting the characteristics standardized, okay? 
uh, giving order to something that were already existing but that was not as formalized as uh, it is now. Try to think of an example of this. So again, put yourself sort of uh, uh, in a company and try to think of how can a company provide a formalized innovation, formalization innovation. Yes, try. Um, Yeah. Uh, the relationship. If you're codifying the marketing knowledge of a company, mm -hmm. in order to be objectified in the field, there's a knowledge that you could design them and you belong to the people over there. Yeah. And by codifying it mm -hmm. and creating the procedures through which you could communicate it to the sales force. Yeah. Okay, so the standardization of a marketing knowledge, marketing approach, market analysis uh, procedures, for example. Again, I don't know where you were working, but okay, very common in uh, large consumer goods companies, consulting companies, and so on. Other examples? Yes. Yes, it might be an organizational innovation. So for example, you build up a business unit in order to deal with specific processes that before were spread around in the company or were embedded in the skill force, okay, in the workforce. Provide me some examples, think of this of a service that was there but wasn't formalized. He made an example, so the idea of, you know, uh, being able to provide some marketing knowledge which was not formalized and then getting it into formal processes. Other examples. What? Yes, correct. Uh, yes, uh, the difference is that here, the idea is that you're already, you have already in place the characteristics, okay, that uh, are needed in order to provide a service. It's just a way of standardizing them. In the other cases, for example, if we think of whatever radical or incremental innovation, okay? You're providing a service with specific characteristics. At some point, you're adding up a characteristic, okay? So of course then the product or the service gets standardized, okay? But in the process of service development, you're adding up something. The idea here, which is very similar to what he was saying, is that I have knowledge floating around, for example, okay? And I want to provide a specific service that I can sell in the market. I guess that's what somehow they do. Okay, and in order to do that, it has to be standardized, formalized, more than standardized, if you want, because the standards usually have the idea of being quite common across different uh, fields or companies. Okay, I agree with you that most of the innovations we've spoken about are in a way formalized, okay? Uh, but the idea is what leads you to develop that particular innovation? What is the process by which you develop that particular innovation, okay? And uh, this has to do with organizational change very much. And this is one of the examples that came into my mind, but of course you can make many others. The placement service in the university, okay? Uh, now you're quite familiar with the existence of a placement office in the university. To you probably that's obvious, okay? It works quite well. So 
you just go, you have a newsletter, whatever it is, that uh, provides you with lots of information and everything. There is a business unit, in a way, dealing with this, okay? Now, the university has always done this type of service, okay? Even when I was a student. Difference was that you had to go to professors or to the administrative people and ask for very random information about what kind of uh, placement opportunities were there for me and so on and so forth, okay? So this service that for you is something, again, quite obvious, wasn't existing up to, I would say, 10 years ago, okay? So you didn't have a placement office in this university. Again, this didn't mean that the university wasn't helping students to find a job, but if you go around and look in other universities, okay, this is not really formalized, okay? Now, this is an example, okay? It is not very competence-destroying because it's actually a company formalizing its tacit knowledge in a way, okay? Uh, university has connection with the outside world, okay? What they did with the creation of the placement services is that they just formalized this. They created the newsletter. They created a place whereby you can have, I don't know, uh, whatever kind of placement service you might need. You have internship news, you have proper placement, and you just exploit the service. Big change for the users Okay, because you do not have to go around and try to understand how, what kind of job you can do afterwards. Okay, big change also for the companies outside because the users in this respect are not only the students, okay, but are also the companies that want to hire the students. So the service that you, the university is provided in this respect is useful to different kinds of users, okay. They've basically standardized something that was there already, okay? And this, of course, made users more willing to pay for that. Again, think of the students and think also of the outside companies, okay? So if I'm a bank and I want to hire a very brilliant graduate Bocconi students, I pay. I think you know that very well, okay? And I put my announcement on the newsletter or whatever it is, okay? As a student, you probably do not see that very much, but hidden behind what you're paying is also this service, okay? Which is probably one of the most valuable, by the way, that you get, okay? Beside the traditional uh, services that you get from the university. This is an example of formalization innovation. You build up something new, you build up a new unit if you want, and in this sense we talk about organizational change, okay? You move people from one unit to the other, okay? You hire new people. It is not competence destroying in the sense that new entrants come into the market because you need to have the knowledge, okay? As Sebastiano was mentioning before, the knowledge very often is embedded in people, you just want to formalize and standardize that, okay? Uh, but the idea is that you bring up a change in an existing organization by formalizing services that were there but were not as standardized as they are now, okay? Galuzzi and Weinstein talk about giving order to service characteristics, okay? And putting in place technical characteristics in order to support them, which means you build a newsletter, you build an IT system that allows students to get into the placement online and so on and so forth, okay? But the knowledge is there, it's just a matter of resetting all the characteristics in order to be of some value for the users. And remember that when we say being of some value for the users, means that the users are willing to pay for that, okay? This is crucial. And uh, we'll go back to this once we analyze the strategies of providing innovation. Uh, very last form of innovation, I would say last but not least, is the so-called recombinative innovation, okay? Uh, new combination of existing service and technical characteristic. This is very similar to what other scholars called architectural 
innovation. I'm not asking you who, but you should know them at this stage. Okay? Uh, the idea is that you exploit existing services or existing products. Okay? You might split up uh, something that you already deliver into different bits and pieces. You recombine the services. You might build up new companies in order to provide uh, new services, taking into account the recombinative nature of the innovation. Okay? So, ad hoc innovation, formalization innovation, recombinative innovation are more specific of the service sector as compared to the radical and incremental innovations we've investigated before. Okay? So this is something that doesn't happen very much if we think of a product, okay, of an R&D activity that leads to the development of a prototype and then to the commercialization of a product. Okay? Yes? If you were to bring them into the approach, what would be the first challenge they have? Good point. Uh, she's saying, well, we know a lot about radical and incremental, okay? Uh, if this is service innovation, what are we integrating? Okay. <coughs> Give me an answer to this before we do some consideration on that. Okay. I started saying that uh, very often this characteristic approach is called as an in integrative approach. Okay. Because it allows to sort of consider in a different way also innovation in manufacturing. Okay. Where is the integration of everything that I've showed you so far? What do you think is the form of innovation that uh, applies in a very similar way to manufacturing and services? Of all the six that the Galuge and Weinstein mentioned. Radical innovation. Architectural innovation. So some said radical. Michela said recombinative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is still a idea of competence enhancing, destroying form of innovation. Uh, yes? <laughs> what? Okay. Now, it's not that there is one answer, okay? So we are discussing, I mean, this is an article, but uh, I'm more than willing to discuss this. If I have to say, uh, the recombinative form of innovation that has to do with the architecture of a service is something that we could think of even if we think of a product, okay? Like a car, like a computer, especially some uh, specific products that, for example, are modular so that you can easily recombine the characteristics of the products, okay? Take a computer, you have different modules, if you recombine them, you have an entire new artifact, okay? Uh, radical and incremental are concepts that are used also for the manufacturing sector, but this, both this, foresee the existence of an R&D activity behind, even the incremental one for the manufacturing, okay? Uh, so where we do see actually a combination, if you want, of manufacturing and service innovations is really in this type of innovation. Okay? Or better, if we start thinking of the recombinative innovation, then we can use the characteristic approach also to evaluate the novelty of some products. Okay? I think that it's pretty clear to all of us that if a company engages in an R&D product develops a new product, patents that. Well, that's an innovation, that's for sure. I mean, I don't think we can uh, claim that it's something not new, okay? So, yes, the radical is common to both approaches, okay? But the output 
of the radical innovation in manufacturing is pretty straightforward. There's not that much discussion on that. The problem is that with services, you do not have patents very often, okay? And so understanding what's a radical output becomes more difficult, okay? And the same, although to a different extent, with the incremental innovation. Now, incremental innovation very often has to do also with the process innovation, which means that if we consider the service activities as technical and process characteristics blur, then it is very difficult, again, to distinguish between what is radical, what is incremental. Uh, so, the concept of recombinative innovation that sheds light on the specificities of services, okay, helps us to understand how we can measure innovation in ways that are different from what we are used to, okay? Not considering patents, probably not considering R&D activity in the most proper sense, okay? Uh, two characteristics, first, with recombinative innovation, you do not have any rupture, okay? You have a continuous change. Remember that one of the characteristics that we had underlined when discussing the most important features of services as compared to manufacturing was the fact that you do not really go from zero to one, okay? It is very difficult that a service emerges out of nothing, okay? With manufacturing, you do have this situation, okay? And so the idea is that the concept of recombinative innovation is particularly suitable to understand the process of change and innovation in the service sector, okay? Also because here it is very difficult to measure the research effort, okay? Uh, we could try to measure the research effort in radical innovation in services, okay? or in incremental innovation in services. Now let's go back to the 3G example, okay? Provision of 3G services. Well, you probably cannot measure the service characteristics part of that particular innovation, but you surely can measure the innovation that takes place in the technical characteristics. Actually, that technical characteristics are also patented or are developed in a standard form, okay? So to a certain extent, you can measure the R&D effort in developing 3G services, okay? You miss one part, which is the user perception, but still, I mean, you can somehow put a value on that research and development. And I think that most companies would be able to do that. With recombinative innovation, very difficult, okay? The development of a new, if you want, architecture of a service, and it's the same if we think of a product, is much less measurable in terms of R&D and patents, okay? Also because very often uh, when we think of patents, we need to think of something that is completely new, that wasn't existing before, that had an application and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, also, go back to the specificity of services that we had analyzed before. Innovation is relatively less costly in services than in manufacturing, okay? For a serious, for a number of different reasons. Users involvement, the simultaneity of production and consumption, okay? Process characteristics are somehow blurred with technical characteristics. So you do not have an assembly line for developing and distributing the services, okay? You have not very much research in the most traditional sense, okay? Uh, and imitation is very easy. Now, if we consider all these characteristics of the service activities, then the idea of recombinative innovation is particularly suitable in order to highlight the specificities in the process of developing innovation, okay? Much more than these two, although again, they are different, uh, than the case of uh, other types of innovation. Because here, at least, you envisage some research activity, okay? Uh, you might have not very easy imitation if you add bits and pieces of characteristics or if you develop an entire new set of characteristics, okay? While with recombinative innovation, indeed, this is something, 
okay, that highlights the specificities of the service activities. Uh, now, some conclusions on this, and then we move to the empirical evidence. Uh, I think that by now we are pretty much convinced that new services are different from new products in the manufacturing industry, that when we talk about innovation in <laughs> services, this is something completely different uh, from innovation in the service sectors because of the specific nature of service activities, tangibility, immutability, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, through the concept of recombinative innovation and through the sort of underlining of the competence enhancing, competence destroying role of different innovation, okay, we can use the characteristics approach also to measure innovation in the manufacturing. Okay? Uh, lots of people have done this, and I think this is a very promising field of research. It's an alternative field to, if you want, the patent analysis okay, of innovation in manufacturing. You take a product, you split up the product in different characteristics, and you try to understand which characteristics are new and which are not new, and how this is reflected in prices, for example. Okay, uh, what is the market for those new products? You can do pretty much the same for products as you do for services. Actually, on products, you usually have more information. This is always true. Okay, so you can measure them more easily. Uh, and if you think about this, the approach is helping to reconcile the very big and tiring debate about technology push, demand pull, innovation. So what is the source of innovation? Some people say, well, innovation is developed uh, by companies, okay? It is companies that engage in R&D activity, they develop products. What users do is sometimes providing feedback, okay? So if you talk to, I think, 90% of scholars in the innovation studies tradition, the idea is that in the end, innovation is very much technology pushed, okay? There is a role for the users, Von Ippel and other people, okay? But if you read Von Ippel in detail, what Von Ippel says is that actually Users provide feedbacks that are the, what are they called, uh, uh, experimental users that can actually test innovation. But in the end, innovation is developed in the big factories and companies, okay? Uh, there is a whole bunch of scholars that puts lots of emphasis on demand, but demand, again, is considered as something that provides feedbacks, not as something that develops innovation, okay? Uh, of course it affects innovation because users' needs are taken into account by companies. So uh, the technology push uh, school does not say that users do not matter. They do matter, but they do matter as a form of incentive to companies, okay? Not as someone who actually is very active in uh, sort of developing innovation. If we consider the characteristic approach, okay, the idea is, okay, take it easy. We have technical characteristics on the one hand and process. We have service characteristics on the other hand, okay? Now, if you think of the technical characteristics of innovation of change in that characteristics, okay, this is a technology push story, full stop, okay? So the idea is that even in services, change in technical characteristics, okay, are very often uh, sort of driven by what's happening in the manufacturing companies. And I don't think that anyone could doubt on this, okay? Even the reverse product cycle that we've seen in Barras, okay? You take a technology and you look at how this technology is implemented in the service company, full stop, okay? 3G services, you take the equipment, you implement them, into a specific company, and then you see how the company exploits that services. Uh, on the other hand, service characteristics have actually to do with the demand pool side, okay? So when Sebastiano goes and uh, wants to subscribe a policy, 
online, he's actually inputting information in the service development. Okay, so the output of the service development process is actually due not only to the sort of development of technical characteristics, but also to the inputs that he's giving to the service development. Okay, so in a way, if you want, uh, if you like very much the demand pool side of the uh, innovation studies, I think that this type of approach is quite useful, okay, to reconcile the debate. Because it just says, we're talking about two different sets of characteristics, okay? And in services, indeed, users' perceptions are somehow okay, shaped by the role of the users. Not just in terms of providing feedback, but in terms of actual development. Okay, think of consulting companies. I always make the example of consulting companies because this is probably the most relevant example in this respect, okay? They take the knowledge from the users and then they formalize it if we want to uh, go back to the example he was making. Okay, now users have an active role on that. It's not just that they're providing feedback. Okay? Uh, second, remember the technological trajectories we were discussing different case of services according to Soete Miotto taxonomy, so you have network-based services, you have personal services, public services, uh, specialized supplier services. Uh, in order to describe the technological trajectory in services, okay, uh, you can look at the different characteristics, how they change over time. Where do service company invest in terms of changing characteristics? Okay, do they change very much the technical structure and keep on providing more or less the same services in a more efficient way? Or do they look more at the user side? And giving the technical characteristics that they have in place, they tend to modify a lot the type of actual perception that users have of these services. Okay? Uh, he was making the 3G example. And he was saying, in the end, users keep on doing the same thing. They surf on the web, they make phone calls, they exchange messages and so on. Service characteristics do not change very much, okay? But the big change is in the technical characteristics. That services are network-based services, okay? So they fall within the big group of network-based services. If we take personal services, you might argue that the set of technical or process characteristics more or less stays the same, and the big effort that companies make in the service characteristic part. So exploiting their own competencies, exploiting their own system in order to provide something which is new to the users, okay? Is that clear? So this is also useful for you when you will uh, discuss your own case of service development, okay? So keep this in mind. Okay, keep in mind the technical versus service characteristics, at least in a very general term. And try to understand where the companies are actually engaging in terms of innovation, in terms of new service development. Okay? Uh, evidence. Now, so far we've discussed different approaches to measure innovation in services. Okay. Uh, we've understood that service firms are very different to manufacturing firms. How can we measure this? Well, this is a very big problem, okay? So lots of scholars and lots of studies base the empirical evidence on surveys, okay? Surveys of all different kinds that relate to specific sector that are more general. Uh, and with survey data, you know that we always have problem of uh, sort of the sample being representative, the sample being actually uh, suitable to measure what we want to measure, and so on and so forth. But this is what we have, and the information that I'm showing you come from a survey at the European level, which is not the Community Innovation Survey, but it's a different survey that uh, was performed in 2003, okay, across a sample of service and manufacturing firms in different European countries. So, uh, 
First of all, this is a very interesting point. If you go and ask to a service company, okay, where do you innovate? What's your innovation strategy, if we want to put it like this? Uh, the answers are really unclear. So the idea is that service companies themselves, besides saying, we look at the user's needs, do not have a clear idea of where their innovation is going. Again, besides saying that we want to provide something new for the users, fair enough, but what's the trajectory? Okay, and uh, they do not really usually distinguish between product, process, organizational innovation, and so on, okay? So a very high, per relatively higher percentage of service companies say that they don't know about the specific orientation. They do bits and pieces of everything, okay? Um, however, for those companies that actually state that they have a clear orientation towards innovation, organizational innovation is what they very often mention, okay? And this is true across all different kind of services. If you go from personal services to network-based services. Okay, financial services were not a big part of the survey. So in general, they are not able to distinguish between product and process, but if they are able to do so, they say, well, we do innovate very much in terms of organizational structure, okay? Which is also something that is specific to the service sector, if you think it in that respect. Uh, not surprisingly, talking about the sources of technology acquisition, okay, uh, they rely very much on cooperation with suppliers and customers, more than with the traditional hard sources, okay, R&D and advanced machinery and equipment. Now, uh, this is a very interesting point because if you remember, very often services were considered as supplier dominated, okay. The evidence tells us that they're not really supplier dominated because the acquisition of external machinery and equipment is much stronger in the manufacturing sector than in the service sector. <coughs> so their main source of knowledge and technology is cooperation with suppliers and customers, okay? Developing new systems that allow them to distribute new services in cooperation with suppliers and customers, okay? So uh, they're not really supplier dominated in the PAVIT sense, at least, of course, we are taking very general results, not most of them. Uh, and finally, competitive advantages in innovation for service companies more than for manufacturing company lie in the skills of the workforce. Again, think back of the formalization innovation, okay? That's a way of exploiting the skills that are embedded in the workforce in order to provide organizational innovation in a way which formalizes existing knowledge, okay? So the competitive advantage in that respect is really the skills of the workshop, of the workforce. Of course, you can say that, well, also manufacturing companies have an advantage in the human capital, we know about the knowledge economy, we know that productivity is very much linked to the quality of the skills and everything. But in comparison with manufacturing, okay, this is one of the most striking differences, okay? So uh, innovation is carrying out specifically through the exploitation of the skills of the personnel. And then, of course, cooperation with suppliers and customers, and this, the identification of market trends. Now, believe me that really whenever you go and ask to a service company uh, in which sense, in which field they are innovating, they always talk about market needs, about market trends, about we know the market so we can develop innovation that is valuable to the users much more than the manufacturing sector. Okay, uh, this is a survey, so I don't know if this is true or not, but the idea is that really they look at the service characteristics bit, much more than at the technical characteristics. If we want to put this uh, evidence in perspective according to the 
approach that we've seen. Now, data. Okay, these are growth rates, first of all. <laughs> okay. Uh, between 1995 and 2004, this is the percentage growth in R&D for services and manufacturing. The yellow is manufacturing. The gray is services. Okay. Uh, what you see is that in some countries, actually, the figure is quite striking. Okay. Not in all countries. So, Sweden. Uh, Korea, Norway, Canada, United Kingdom to some extent, Denmark have a similar pattern. But in other countries, actually, the growth in uh, R&D for services is much higher than the growth in R&D for manufacturing. Explanations for this? R&D expenditures in services and manufacturing. Of course, declared R&D expenditures. Yes. Okay. So the economy is moving, as we saw in the first class, towards a more and more important role for services. So this is not surprising. Although the tertiarization very often has to do with increase of value added or employment. Okay. So you can have a value added in the economy that is made for 70% of the service sectors, but this does not necessarily translate in this figure, okay? So services might be less R&D intensive, okay, but might produce lots of value added. But surely the tertiarization is an important point. What else? Look at Ireland, okay? Look at Finland. Uh, Finland is uh, Germany, Italy, not to talk about. Yeah, yeah the, the high taxation on whatever <laughs> means that <laughs> you might. Okay, let's be more specific, exactly. So the service sector, and what happened in Ireland? What's this, the real story behind financial detaxation, or better, following financial detaxation? Uh, the software sector, okay? Uh, a very peculiar story. The software sector is an hybrid because it falls somehow in the services uh, activities, okay? Although it has some peculiarities and we will investigate it in two or three lectures, I think. Uh, but still, I mean, this is R&D, okay? So this is actually a figure related to the research activities of companies. Um, the time span is very peculiar, okay? You have all the ICT bubble going on there. And most of the internet dot-com companies were service companies, okay? So now in terms of research, developing of new services, developing of technical systems, surely this uh, figure had something to do also with that one. But just to let you understand that uh, R&D, it is not just a manufacturing story. Although if we go and look at the forms of innovation as declared, and these are data from the last community innovation survey, in different companies as percentage of total, okay, so making 100 uh, the type of innovation, okay. Uh, acquisition of machinery, this is R&D, so the second square is basically the percentage of intramural R&D over total innovation, okay. Uh, the primary sector, engineering-based manufacturing, not so surprising, okay. These are other manufacturing. Look at knowledge intensive services. Okay, they acquire machinery, equipment, whatever else, perform R&D activities as much as other type of manufacturing sectors. Okay, on the other hand, if you look at the retailing distribution, this is a very interesting case. 
okay? Half of the innovation relates to the acquisition of technologies, half of the innovation relates to marketing expenditure. Okay, now you might argue that marketing expenditure is not really a form of innovation, but again, the idea is that I get knowledge on the market and I process that knowledge in order to provide new services, okay? Which is what, again, the example was showing. So marketing expenditure is very common in most services but this group. And again, this group is something that uh, we want to consider in depth. Fair enough, but uh, the innovation in services is not unique across different service activities. So uh, we might generalize saying that organizational innovation is more important than product and process innovation, uh, that these companies acquire knowledge and technology mostly through cooperation with users and producers. Okay, that let aside the knowledge intensive services, most of these companies' innovation lie in the marketing activities and in the skills of the workforce. But of course, services are as different as manufacturing activities, okay? And uh, as this quotation says, a serious challenge remains to unpack this different type of services and to explore their different approaches to innovation. So most of the studies so far, really most of the studies on innovation in services that actually provide measure of innovation in services, take the service sector as a big, unique group. Okay, and what we've underlined in the previous lectures, a bit less than this one, is that actually hospitals, banks, hairdressers are very different, okay? But they're all service activities, okay? So now what we will do from next lecture on is trying to unpack the characteristics of different type of services, okay? Uh, given that, we will go back to Schumpeter, okay? Uh, so Schumpeter conceptualization of innovation was not limited to product and process, okay? Uh, what were the other forms of innovation for Schumpeter? Probably the most quoted uh, economist in the innovation study graduate and undergraduate programs, so you should Okay. Yeah, but in terms of pure innovation, okay, lots of people just distinguish between product and process. This is just a small bit of, yes. Organizational. What else? Creation of new markets. Does it sound you <laughs> kind of familiar? Okay. Uh, the thing with product and process is that they're very easy to measure, but this does not mean that the other forms of innovation are not interesting. Uh, so we will look basically at three domains, firms output, firms internal organization, firms external organization. Okay. So the idea is that yes, you might have product and if you want market innovation, okay. You have process and organizational innovation and that has to do with the internal structure of the firm and you have uh, innovations that stem out of the network. Uh, now I'm jumping to something because I want to, to discuss with you and we have just five minutes left about this. Now, this is uh, the matrix that I've shown you last time or two times ago, okay, regarding basically technological trajectories and services, okay? So you recognize the service based upon scale intensive, physical and information networks, uh, science based and specialized technology supplier, personal services, public services. You remember all the different types of users, innovation, appropriability means, technological trajectory, sources of technology, size of firms, blah, 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 okay? What are we going to do 
is looking at banking insurance and mobile communication sector as far as the first group of services are concerned with the insurance companies we will have an external seminar so we will have a person from AXA insurance uh, working in the innovation department so you will be free to ask her what does she mean by innovation we will investigate because I think this is one of the most promising fields of research also uh, for your studies the knowledge intensive business services okay and within here remember just for the sake of knowledge that you have uh, consulting companies you have lawyers you have designers you have engineers you have software producers okay so also in this group of services we will see very different trajectory uh, we will look at the touring sector this is one of most interesting and entertaining in a way sector to look at okay very popular recently in terms of studies we will have a lecture and an external seminar on that and then we will look at hospitals okay uh, I don't know if you've made up your mind or what kind of services you're interested in but just to give you an idea of how students uh, get affected by what's going on in the course these are last year group works, okay? There were less students, so don't look at the numbers. So, somehow concentrated in the first two group of services, there was a, a group work on Scandia Banken, which is basically an online, uh, well, <laughs> some of you know, an online bank, uh, Scandinavia, Norway. Uh, there was a very interesting group work, I'm not telling you about the grades, but just to, which was somehow putting together innovation in banking and innovation uh, in uh, KIBS, so knowledge intensive business services. Okay, so looking at the role of sort of new consulting services that was implemented within banks, okay, with a specific case. Uh, then there was an interesting case of KIBS, but completely different from the first one. Basically, business process offshoring in India. R&D, I would add, business process offshoring in India. Okay. A group of people discussed about the georeferentiated mobile services. I don't know if you know <laughs> what that is basically mobile services that allow you to go around place or around town or I don't know looking for a restaurant when you arrive in New York and you want to go and eat Indian food this kind of things okay uh, basically innovation in the tourism industry broadly speaking although they were somehow trying to merge mobile communication and tourism and a more traditional but not for this less interesting case was innovation in the healthcare and uh, students brought examples of innovation in the US and in the Italian system that have a very different institutional setting and therefore allows to study very different type of innovation in services. Okay? Basically, all of them stick very much okay, to what I proposed as case studies for my lectures okay also because they were more familiar with that they had more materials and so on and so forth but they really encourage you okay to go out of the main path if you want so if someone wants to investigate innovation i don't know in retail for example services okay we're not dealing with retail services but it's a very interesting case, okay? If some of you want to, I don't know, investigate innovation in educational services, okay, which is a very interesting also case, which we do not have the time to tackle in depth, feel free, okay? So I'm happy if you're starting from this, but just to give you an idea that very often uh, with my lecture, I try to push students, this is not my intention, okay? So this was actually, totally by chance. Think about the case studies. Uh, next Tuesday, I would like to have some hints on groups and possible topics possible for uh, development. Okay? So we stop here and we see.